The following is a production of New Mexico State University. Hi. It has been a long journey from the old world into the new. Those last few miles have been particularly cumbersome. How often had I wished on that long trek from Council Grove, Kansas, to the New Mexico Territory, that I could have sat astride one of those mules that accompanied the wagon train. <laughs> but that was not meant to be. For once I did try to sit astride one of those mules, as I recall, <laughs> and the poor animal collapsed under me. <laughs> I choose to think that it was not so much my weight as the burden that I was carrying deep in my soul. My name is Giovanni. Giovanni Maria Agostini Giustiniani. I was born in that area of the world called the Piedmont, those foothills between Italy and France. It was there that I came from a wealthy Italian family. My own father was a count. And so from a very early age, from my velvet prime, I had been groomed to assume my place in society. <laughs> but that was not meant to be. You see, I had come home late one night from a from an evening of carousing and drunkenness. And as I went to my bedroom and sat by the edge of the bed to remove my sandals, suddenly there was an apparition. I couldn't believe it. But as I peered deep into the lights, it was the Holy Virgin herself who had come to see me. She looked at me softly, but she spoke sternly and she said, Giovanni, Giovanni, hijo, my son, this is not the life for which you were meant. You must be driven out into the desert to be purified. <laughs> I prayed all night before the apparition, and by morning I knew what I had to do. I must leave my beloved village of Novara and go off into the new world. I boarded a Spanish ship that took me from the old world into the new hemisphere. Ay. My first stop after so many weeks upon the ocean sea was a little place called Alcama, Chile. It was there that I shunned the society of men, preferring instead to find my solace among the wilds of the mountain crags. One day when I was walking there, I felt the wind come and whip up all about me and then a voice seemed to emanate from one of the hills, and it said, Come, abide in me. Come, abide in me. Come, abide in me. How often had I thought, all those many weeks and months as I lay there in the cave, praying and fasting, that I needed to find direction in my life, I thought of my own predecessor, St. Jerome, Hieronymus, many centuries before my own, had taken the ancient Gospels and translated them from the ancient languages into the Vulgate Latin of his own time. Then it occurred to me that I should do the same thing. I would take the Gospels of St. Jerome and translate them into the Spanish of the New World. And so this was to be my first act of piety here in the new world. How often had I thought that perhaps I might subsist on the roots and berries that I was to find along the way, <laughs> but they were not to be forthcoming. From the local people, I learned how to grind the crude mountain corn called maize and crush 
the curdles between two stones, something that they called a, a metate. Then they taught me how to cast the cornmeal into boiling water, and so I was able to produce a wonderful hardy corn gruel called atole. This was to be the only food that was to be palatable to me here in this new world. I learned much about healing, natural healing, from the mountain folk. They taught me, for example, how to cauterize wounds using the local ants. The ants are rather big there in that part of Chile. And what they would do is they would stomp upon the ground with their feet, and then they would apply the ants directly to the wound. The ants' pincers would seal themselves, grabbing onto the open wound, and then they would lop off the head and repeat the process. Soon they had cauterized the entire wound in this fashion. I grew quite skillful at cauterizing wounds in this manner, but I combined this with my Latin prayers. That is when the village elders began to take offense, for they thought that I was invoking some kind of an unholy spirit. They conspired against me, and I was chased out of my cave and out of Chile. I continued going ever northward. This time I arrived at the island of Cuba. There I met with some friendly Indios. These natives were called the Taino. Now I must realize that the Taino people are a peaceful people. They had learned rudimentary Spanish from the Franciscan missionaries there before me. Oh, how much they loved the tales of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus. But when they read my own translations of the Bibles, especially of Jesus and how he raised his friend Lazarus from the dead, and then the daughter of Hiro, ah, uh, that's when they began to take real interest. <laughs> one day, one of their own children, a boy, a nine-year-old boy, I believe, was swimming off the beach. He was pulled under by the strong undertow. He went under. The frantic people brought him to me, seemingly dead, and placed him upon my lap. I began to work his little hands and feet. I turned him over and hit him gently upon the back, all the while praying in Italian, Libera me domine de morta eterna, deliver me, O Lord, from everlasting death. I also added prayers of my own. Miserere me, have mercy on me, sum filius tuus, I am your son. Suddenly, the little boy began to vomit and sputter and cough, out much of the liquid that was trapped within his own lungs. The joyful mother screamed, and I returned the child to the mother. Now I had suspected that the people would be happy that I had done this to them. But again, the village elders took offense because they thought that I was showing a way of healing that they did not know themselves. Late that night, as I lay upon the beach, they came and gagged and bowed me put me on one of those rough outriggers and pushed me off into sea, where, guided by an unseen hand, I was guided to the North American continent. Once I recovered my health, I was released back into the wilderness by the friendly American natives, and I continued my trek ever northward. This time I arrived at the little village of Montreal in Canada. It was there in Montreal that I met some fellow missionaries such as myself. They were Silesian and Dominican friars who were so overjoyed to see me. That is, of course, until they read my rough translations of St. Jerome's work. That's when they began to get suspicious. They said that they suspected that I was not a real hermit because I had never taken vows of poverty, chastity, or obedience. I tried to explain to them that I am a Carthusian monk, that the vows that I had taken were private ones. They did not believe it. Late one night they came out into the snow and found me lying prostrate upon the snow with my arms outstretched in the form of a cross. They thought that I was completely demented. I tried to explain to them that this is the posture that missionaries to the New World often take as a sign of their dedication to the new country. They dragged me back indoors, and they tried to force-feed me animal flesh. 
I tried to tell them that I would eat nothing but maize, the corn gruel that I often prepared for myself. That's when they decided that they did not want anything to do with me. They chased me out of their encampment. Three times I have been coming to a new country and three times I have been chased away. How orphaned I feel in this wilderness. I fled southward going along the Mississippi River banks. Finally, I decided to turn westward and I arrived at the little place called Council Grove, Kansas. It was in Council Grove, Kansas that I met a wonderful man named Don Eugenio Romero. Senor Romero told me that he was going to the New Mexico Territory and that I was welcome to join his wagon train. He was fascinated by the fact that I would not sit on stride one of his mules or even in the luxury of one of his own carts, but that I preferred to walk all the way. Oh, he sidled up his horse next to me and following me at a leisurely pace, he told me about the marvels of his beloved New Mexico. He told me that this New Mexico territory was a part of old Mexico and that it had been a part of Spain 20 years prior to my arrival there in 1843. He also told me that now the new Americanos were bringing their new wares because their wares were a little less expensive and of a higher grade and quality than those that were brought from Chihuahua, Mexico. I continued going with him and he made that long journey into the West. Very, very easy and very short. Finally, <laughs> finally after many weeks we arrived at Las Gainas de Las Vegas. Having arrived at Las Vegas, it was my sad duty to bid a farewell to Senor Romero and to the wagon train. But I wanted to be alone. I needed to atone for many of my sins, from many of the people that I felt that I had offended on my trek into New Mexico. And so I removed the flagellum that often hung around my waist, and I kissed it's tip. In nomine patris, fili et spiritui sante. For the love of God, I punish my miserable flesh for all of those who I have offended. Per deum et pro deo. Per deum et pro deo. Per deum et pro deo. Through God and for God. Through God and for God. Through God <laughs> and for God. I punish this body of mine. Mea culpa. Mea culpa. Mea maxima culpa. As I sat there on the desert floor, I began to look up into the night sky. And there directly over me I could see several points of light. Una. Due, tres, quattro, cinque, sei, sette. There were seven points of light directly over me. As I lay there looking up into the night sky, I was reminded of an old tale that was told to me by one of the Spanish sailors coming to the New World. He told me that Spain is an ancient country that had been occupied by the Moors from the year 711 to 1492. He said that during that time, there is a tale that was told about seven Christian kings who were imprisoned by seven Moorish kings for refusing to acknowledge Allah is the greatest God of them all. They were to be punished, executed the following morning. According to that tale, the night before they were to die, seven good Moors lowered seven ropes down into prison and freed them, put them aboard seven ships that sailed across seven seas until they arrived at this very land of New Mexico, this land of Jauja, this land of Cibola, this land of Antilia, where gold was so common that they even erected seven cities of gold from it. He taught me the ancient romance ballads 
I think I still recall them. Desde la tierra de Jauja me mandan solicitar que me vaya y que me vaya de un tesoro a disfrutar. To this fabled land of Jauja I've been summoned to partake from a treasure that is waiting for each man to seek and take. Que dicen amigos vamos a ver si dicen verdad. Si es verdad lo que nos dicen, nos quedamos por allá. What say ye, comrades, shall we go and see if it be true? If there's fact in these old rumors, <laughs> we'll exact our booty too. Hay árboles de tortillas, matas de jarros de atole, hay barricas de menudo ya compuestas con pozole. I can see tortillas in the treetops and plants holding cordial mush near great pots of warm menudo with pozole nice and lush. Las pontadas son de azúcar y las sierras son de té. En los ríos corre leche con azúcar y café. And the mountains are spun from sugar. The hills are made of tea. In the river flows great coffee, rich with cream as it can be. Las lagunas son de aceite, llenas y sin derramar. Vuelan los patos asados con su pimienta y su sal. And our lakes are filled with oil, seeping from each poor and fault. And the roast ducks fly through the heavens, spiced with pepper and with salt. En los arrios corre whisky, si si quiere emborrachar. Hay también le dan de palos al que quiera trabajar. In the gullies flows great whisky, if you'd like to sip and slurp. And they strike ambitious people who prefer to sweat and work. Que dicen amigos vamos, a ver si dicen verdad. Si es verdad lo que nos dicen, <laughs> we'll exact our booty too. And so it was that the seven cities of gold of the ancient Indian legend did exist. But the Spanish did not know where to look for it, for you see, at that time, the Spanish concept of time and space was very linear. This was north, that was south, the other was east, and that was west. To the Indios of the New World, the concept of time and space was much more spatial. North was Polaris, the North Star. South was the center of the Earth. East was where the sun rose, and west was where it set. Now. If the Spaniards had known how to interpret the ancient legends, they would have realized that when the Indians said north, they did not need to go all the way to Kansas looking for Gran Quivira, very close to that place where I had started my trek, oh, so long ago back into New Mexico. Rather, they would have looked up at the stars and realized that directly overhead is a constellation Ursa Major, or the Big Bear, or as the Americanos call it, the Big Dipper. And when you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, the seven points of light, the seven cities of gold did exist in the ancient legend, but they would not know where to find it. <laughs> it would be left for others to figure that out. How often had I thought in my trek across the world that many of the misconceptions as to culture come from misconceptions as to what reality might be. For you see, nowhere is this more true than in this, my beloved New Mexico. It has been orphaned almost oh, as many times as I have been orphaned. The first time that this orphan dumb happened was when the natives were driven away from the Grand Chaco Canyon, where they had established the first civilization here. Had it been because of famine, because of drought, or because of enemies, but they had to leave the land. We will never know why. 
the second time that we were orphaned was because the Europeans came looking for land, gold and silver, finding nothing, they continued ever northward. The third time that they were orphaned was when the Mexicans came, trying to get away from Mother Spain, and the fourth time when the Americanos came, taking advantage of that Louisiana purchase of 1803 to bring their wares to this side of the world. And on their heels came the German Jews, also merchants, with them the Moors and the Basques, who had been deadly enemies among the Spanish. But now they had to learn to cooperate with each other if they were going to survive in this New Mexico desert. The Indios of New Mexico have wonderful legends also. They claim that they are the ancestors of the mighty Aztecas. According to the ancient legends, once upon a time in the village of Sicuique, now called Pecos, New Mexico, there was a great chieftain named Moctezuma the Great. Now Moctezuma the Great had a vision from the deathless gods who told him that he must go further and send his people along with him. He was to go to the Tenochtitlan or the gathering place of the gods. And the sign that he was to receive was this. He was to find an eagle perched on top of a cactus devouring a snake in its beak. So he mounted on the back of a mighty eagle and he flew ever southward, seeding his people along the Rio Grande till at length he arrived at that gathering place of the gods. And it was there that he built that mighty empire that was to remain unshaken until it was conquered in 1521 by Cortes in Mexico. I, that first night in New Mexico, I sought out solace in a cave called La Sierra del Tecolote, or Owl Mountain. I lay down upon the hard-packed earth using a stone to cradle my head. But sleep was not to be forthcoming, for I was haunted by visions between wakefulness and sleeplessness. I could see myself lying at the entrance to a cave, facing the cave wall, and unseen by me, suddenly a hand came up behind me, an upraised hand with a dagger, and it brought it down between my shoulder blades multiple times. It pinned my very bones to the ground. I felt my lifeblood streaming away from me. I was lying in a pool, in a, in a puddle of blood, and water at the same time. I sat up, not knowing where I was. And then I realized that I had actually been in two places at the same time. It was my first experience as a bilocator. It was to be very disturbing to me, this experience, this idea that I could be in two places at the same time. Early the next morning, I walked out of my cave, pondering what had happened to me the night before. I had walked a short distance away from my cave when I came across this ravine. And across the ravine, there had been a log that had fallen. I put my foot upon it rather unsteadily, and it toppled back and forth. I put my second foot upon it, realizing that it could sustain my weight. And I began to inch my way across that log. I realized that one false move, and I would be toppled to my very death. Now you have to realize that I had never been disturbed by the idea of death itself. It was not the what, but the how that had always bothered me. And somehow I knew that it was my destiny. The rest of the morning I spent my time walking back and forth across the log unsteadily, just to remind myself of the inconstancy of life and how we must take advantage of each day and each hour because we may be dead the following day. <laughs> New Mexico is a small place, not geographically speaking, but rather speaking of the mind. For you see, many of the residents here take gossip to be the gospel truth. They must have been listening to the tales told to them by Senor Romero. These were the stories that I had told him on my way up from Council Grove, Kansas, 
into the New Mexico Territory. He told them of my experience as a faith healer. He told them, for example, of how I would pick the wild mountain mint and boil it into a tea and massage the feet and ankles of people so that I could reduce the fever that they had and their headaches. He also told them of how I would make another wash made out of this chamomile, this uh, manzanilla, and give it to mothers to apply to the babies as a cure for diaparash. Furthermore, he told them that I had learned from many of the natives how to take the trementina, the, uh, the gum sap from pinyon trees, and to apply it to open wounds to suck out pus and infections. And from local Navajo people, I had learned how to make a tea out of the globe mallow, which is the malba plant. And then this was to be used, given to women for birth control tea. And the men would then take the crushed leaves and apply them to their own feet to reduce swelling and inflammation. One of the local men had also told me something that I have never forgotten. He said, pointing to a stinging nettle plant, he said, see that plant that itches? Within two feet of any offending plant, you will find its antidote. Never forget this. Use it. And so by slow degrees, I continued to grow. And of course, I was supported by my faith also. And people began to see me as a mystic, as I was to find out very soon. One morning, just as I was finishing my daily offices, I noticed that there was a movement by my cave. A woman, a heavyset matron, came up to me, almost modestly and quiet, and with eyes downcast, she said to me, Senor Ermitaño, please help me. I said, what is wrong, Senora? She said, it is my son. I believe that he is dying. I asked her to tell me the story, and she said, yesterday I was making some bread, baking it in my orno, when suddenly my neighbor, a woman who's always bothering me, came up to me, and she asked that I give her a loaf of bread. I did not want to give her that loaf of bread, but she kept asking me and asking me. Finally, I agreed, but telling her only after it is cooled down. That afternoon, unseen by anyone, I cut into the loaf of bread with a sharp knife, and I injected a little rat poison into it. I gave it to my son, and I said, take it to the lady. Senor Ermitaño, I did not mean that she should die. I just wanted to make her so sick that she would quit asking me for more bread. Well, unfortunately for me, she chose that afternoon to be magnanimous, and she split the bread in half, giving one half to my son, keeping the better half for herself. My son came back home. He had been eating bread all afternoon. When he arrived at home, he was pale and then flushed, and began to convulse. I put him on top of my own bed. I did not know what to do, but I was sure that it was because of the rat poison. Senor Ermitaño, you must help me. I looked at her and I said, Senora, your son, I fear, is already dead. Well, a mother's wounds, no, no bounds. She began to pull at her lapels and at her apron. She tore at her, own hair, at her own hair and pulled it down like some kind of a holy mantle. And she said, Senor Ermitaño, do what you can for my son. I asked her to show me to her house. And I followed her quietly, reverently praying all the way to her house. When we arrived at the house, the boy was already dead. I lifted his hand quietly held it between both of mine, and I prayed for the second time that day, Libera me, Domine, de morte eterna. Deliver me, Lord, from everlasting death. Suddenly, the boy began to breathe. He sat up, and I knew that I had sealed my own fate, for you see. By the raising of the dead boy, now suddenly, people would begin to come to my cave, and I could no longer support such a multitude, it would be up to me to leave. The following morning, I was digging with my fingers in front of my cave 
when Senor Romero came forward. He asked me what I was doing. He could see that I was digging, and he said, Senor Ermitaño, do you know, know that this would be easier to do if you had a pickaxe and shovels? <laughs> I said, you bring them, and I will use them. He rode back to his house and brought them back within the hour. We continued digging. He did not ask me what I was doing, neither did I tell him. By late afternoon, we had dug a hole that was three feet wide and six feet long and six feet deep. That is when he realized that we had dug a grave. He looked squarely at my eyes and he said, for whom is this grave? And I said, Senor, this is for me. And he said, but you walk it. And I said, the time has come for me to leave Las Vegas, New Mexico, and into my destiny. I must go to the southern part of the state and find my own destiny among the Oregon Mountains there. But I want you to continue coming up here every day and pray in front of this hole. One day you will come to pray in front of the hole and you will see that it is completely filled in. By that you will know that I am dead. Then I bid him a fond farewell and I walked away to my destiny. I continued going ever southward and westward toward the setting sun. I decided to bypass Santa Fe with its crowded streets and multitudes, choosing instead to walk toward Pecos, the birthplace of that Moctezuma legend. Before I arrived at the village of Pecos, I was met by a young man who told me that he was a descendant of Don Luis de Carvajal y de la Cueva, who was one of its first settlers. Apparently, Señor de la Cueva had arrived there with uh, another comrade of his, Gaspar Castaño de Sosa. Now, Gaspar Castaño de Sosa had left the village of Almaden, Mexico, because he felt that his life was in peril there. And so without the permission of the King of Spain or the Viceroy of Mexico, he and 170 other people decided to leave. These were people who were wanted by the Inquisition. These were people with last names like Sosa, people like Ramirez, people like Gutierrez, people like Trevino, Rael, and even Torres. They had all been sought by the Inquisition. Now, his own ancestor had lived in the northeastern part of Mexico at that time, and he had decided to bring the people to this very valley itself. But before he was able to come over here, he had been recalled back to Mother Spain, and charges were brought against him that he was a Jewish apostate, that he was a sympathizer, and perhaps maybe even a crypto-Jew himself, fleeing from the office of the Inquisition. He put all 170 people under the care of a young Indian man named Miguel, and he charged him that he should bring them here. And he went off to Spain to face his own charges, never to return again. Hardly had I walked away from that Pecos Valley when I came across a strapping young man vainly trying to plant some grapevines into the soil. When I approached him and I said, oh, Filius Beus, my son, this will not take place here, he said, Senor Herbitario, on the contrary, did you know that the oldest grapevines in the continent were grown right here just south of Socorro? I asked him to tell me the story. <laughs> he said that it was two friars not unlike myself, one of them by the name of Gracia de Zuniga, and the second one named Antonio de Arteaga, who had planted the very first mission grapes over here in a Piro Indian village called Senecu. And that it was these grapes that brought forth the nectar that was so necessary for the Holy Communion service that was used among the Catholics so many years ago. These grapes were known as Vitis Venifera in Latin, and in Spain they were known as the common Monica grape. The young man also told me another wonderful tale. He told me that the United States, ever eager for westward expansion, had decided that it needed some way to bridge the huge gap, the large 
span of land between the New Mexico Territory and the California Territory. It had been suggested by the then young Secretary of War, a man named Jefferson Davis, that camels be brought into the New Mexico Territory. Well, camels were sought all over Saudi Arabia and the Middle Eastern countries, and at length they arrived in New Mexico. Unfortunately, the people who were to use them, the people who were setting up miles upon miles of telegraphs across the southwest, were told that camels could subsist on little food and little land. Unfortunately for the poor animals, their owners thought that little food and little water meant no food and no water, and so many of the camels were starved to death. It was in 1865 that people decided that we needed a different tactic to get across from New Mexico to California, and so the railroad started to come in. It was at that time that the telegraph people sold the camels over to the U.S. Postal Service, and the few remaining camels were set, uh, were set free on the desert floor. You can still see some of them hopping across the desert on warm nights, even today. As we were walking back home that evening, Epifanio told me yet another story about the United States government. He said that, eager for westward expansion, they had set up a cavalry and infantry unit shortly after the collapse of the Civil War. It was in 1863 that they set up the 9th and 10th Cavalry Regiments here in New Mexico, made up completely of freed slaves. These people, because they rode like thunder and like the wind and had curly black hair, were often called by the Cheyenne and the Comanche Indians the Buffalo Soldiers. These Buffalo Soldiers were the only buffer that the United States government had on the Western Plains, and they made up 20% of all of the mounted people here in the American West. But these people were not very well treated. Sometimes when they had to go through town, their white counterparts would make them dismount and walk at the same level as their animals so that no one could see them. And then when we got to the, to the other end of town, they were allowed to mount their horses again. This was not something that I thought was very equitable, not very fair, but something that did indeed happened here in the New Mexico Territory. Yes, these very buffalo soldiers were the ones that were the buffers against rustlers and outlaws and what the United States government considered wild or hostile Indians. People like Cochis, like Mangas Coloradas, like Sitting Bull. No, something needed to change. We need to heal here in New Mexico. I must continue going ever southward. This is not the place for me. Hi. The trek has been long, tiring. But finally, finally after many weeks, I arrived at the little village of Doña Ana where I saw a crude hovel made out of adobe bricks. I collapsed in the shade of that hovel, and a local woman came and gave me a dipper full of water. And she said to me, how is it, Senor Ermitano, that you have arrived over here without passing first through Fort Selden? <laughs> Fort Selden, I asked. And she said, yes, about six miles up the road, Fort Selden. It is a fort that was established in 1865, and the soldiers there, the cavalry people there, have absolutely nothing to do rather than to harass bypassers. And so what they do is they while away the time doing nothing. <laughs> in fact, instead of calling it Fort Selden, sometimes they call it oh, Fort Seldom. <laughs> I marveled at her dry wit, but I thanked her for the water and then asked her some more things. She told me, as she spoke to me, I noticed that she was looking intently at my hands. She said, I come from Gypsy Strain myself, and I can tell by looking at your hands, Senor Ermitaño, that you are not long for this life, and that in the end you will die in violence. Your very bones will be pinned to the ground. <laughs> it was a as if she were reading my soul. 
I tried to make, to make not much of it. It bothered me. What could I do? And so I asked her, tell me, tell me about this Doña Ana. She said, well, there are many tales. Some people think that Doña Ana, the village, is named after Doña Ana Robledo, who was the granddaughter, the great-granddaughter of Senor Antonio de Robledo, who was the first casualty in this area. When he was massacred, and after the Taos massacre, the Taos rebellion of 1680, she lost all hope and died here. But the truth of the matter is that Doña Ana is not named after her. Doña Ana is named after Doña Ana Cordova. Doña Ana Cordova was a local woman who defended her land valiantly against the Apache Indians of this area. And she gave us the strength and the courage to continue doing this among ourselves. So she is honored by having the entire village named after her. After you leave Doña Ana, she said to me, you will walk about six miles, and there you will find tres cruces, three crosses, one next to the other. Some people think that these three crosses were set up because some people had been massacred there by the inhospitable Apache, the Manso Indians, perhaps. Others choose to think that they have been there since time immemorial in honor of some holy men who died there. But once you have seen them, that is to be your sign, you will turn left and look up into the mountains de la Soledad, the Manso Mountains, also called the Oregon Mountains because they look like church organs pointing skyward. That is where you will find a cave. And that cave is low slung upon the earth, kind of like an, an open tomb. That is where you will go. I thanked her. But when I continued walking over to the three crosses, suddenly I had a desire to go to the right instead of to the left. I went along the Rio Grande, bypassing as many people as I could, especially because I had been told about the sheriff of La Mesilla, New Mexico, Don Mariano Barela. He was always a little leery about, about strangers in this part of the world. So I sneaked through the back part into the plaza, and I looked around. I saw that it was very typical, like many Mexican plazas, with a church of San Albino at the far end. I went into the far corner and knelt down to pray in the solace of the church. I had barely started my morning prayers when suddenly a man came up and whispered in my right ear, Señor Ermitaño, my name is Padre José de Jesús Cabeza de Vaca del Valle de la Mesía. I looked at him. That was quite a mouthful, even for a local. <laughs> he said, come outside, I will tell you more. Well, we went outside into La Mesilla Plaza, where there was a plataforma, a, a, a raised area, and we sat there under the shade of the trees. And he told me about this area. He said that La Mesilla was part of the United States of America, now, not because it had been deeded to the United States because of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1846, but because it had been incorporated in a strip of land that had been ignored by the surveyors that came from El Paso, Texas, all the way to the border of California. This had been bought over by the United States of America much later on, something that was called the Gadsden Purchase, and now that we were true Americans, the soldiers from Fort Fillmore had brought and planted the American flag over La Mesilla, and that's where it was. I sat around basking in the sun of late afternoon with Padre Baca next to me. He asked me about my mission there, and I told him, I am here to see a man. He said, Albert Jennings Fountain. I was surprised that he knew why I was there. He said, this is a small village. Everyone knows everyone's business here. And I said, how am I to find Senor Jennings? He said, you walk past La Mesilla to the left, and there in those houses nestled, just knock on the third door, and he will be there. I thanked him, and I continued going. It was already late into the afternoon when I knocked at the door of Senor Fountain. 
The door was opened by a lady who looked at me with some suspicion. And she said, yes, may I help you? And I said, I have been told that this is the home of Albert Jennings Fountain. She said, this is not his house, this is my house. I am Senora Barela, what do you want? Before I could answer, there was a rustle heard from within. And a tall, stately man came and clicked his heels at me and said, I am Albert Jennings Fountain. I said, Giovanni, Giovanni Maria Gustini Giustiniani. He said, come in. And I said, Jennings is not a common name here in the Hispanic Southwest. He said, actually, that was my father's name. My father was a sea captain named Salomon Jennings. But I decided to take my mother's maiden name. She was a French Huguenot stock. Her last name was De La Fontaine. She was Catherine De La Fontaine. I decided to anglicize it to the more American fountain. How may I help you? We sat down, and I began to talk to him, telling him that my time in the desert was coming to a close, and that I needed to find a way of getting back across New Mexico. But before I could continue, suddenly I began to go into this strange trance. My head began to pound. My temples were afire. And as I looked at him, I could see a strange vision of Senor Fountain. He was coming out of the Tula Rosa Basin, he with his infant son. He had been over there prosecuting some cattle wrestlers. Now these same wrestlers were looking at him from beyond the shadows. I saw that his wagon began to come out of there. And as it did, he was ambushed by these three very men. Before he could even shriek, they had clonked him over the head, as well as his son, and they quickly began to stab him and strip his body of all of its possessions. Then riding pale mail back into the white sand, they dug a quick, hasty grave into the white sand and buried both father and son. This was to become a mystery of New Mexico for many, many years. No one would be able to figure out what happened to Mr. Albert Jennings Fountain, even to the present day. I shuddered at the inhumanity of man to man, and I was so taken aback by what I had seen in my vision as a bilocator that I fled from the home of Senor Fountain, and I didn't even ask him the reason why I had come. The following morning, right in the Plaza of La Mesilla, I met with Padre Baca. I told him about my experience with Albert Jennings Fountain. He said to me, I was wondering what it was that a Catholic needed with a Protestant. <laughs> I liked his sense of humor. He made me feel very comfortable. As we were busy talking, I noticed that there were two mounted men on horseback coming towards us. The good padre said, these are two brothers. Perhaps they can tell you a way to get out of New Mexico without having to go east by way of San, San Antonio. Perhaps they know something about the Butterfield stage. Before I could talk to them, they were introduced to me. The first one said, Senor Ermitaño, my name is Senor Serrano. Mucho gusto de conocerle. I shook his hand. The second one said, and I am Bialkin, Bialkin Serrano. Before I could even shake his hand, suddenly I was seized by some kind of a feeling, and I said to him without looking sideways, Senor, that horse that you are riding is stolen property. Padre Baca looked shocked. He turned to Bialkin and he said, Hijo mío, is this true? Bialkin Serrano cast his eyes down and said, Senor Padre, I need you to know that I am a poor man. I don't know what it was that possessed me to steal this particular horse, but please, please, I am willing to make restitution. Take this pouch of gold and give it to the owner of the animal. It is much more than the animal is worth, but I need to make atonement, and I also need to go confess my sin. The padre said to him, I will hear your confession, my son. Follow me and then handed me the pouch of gold. He said, Senor Ermitaño, would you take this and give it back to the rightful owner of that horse? I tucked away the pouch within the folds of my own habit, and I promised to do so. I bowed 
and I prayed for them and I watched them disappear. Now, unknown to me at that time, there was a pair of eyes that were watching me and more importantly, watching the pouch of gold. When I walked out of La Messia, I walked a little to the east. I approached the village of Tortugas that had been founded there in 1855. As I was looking there, suddenly an old lady came up to me and she said, Hey, Senor Ermitaño, Senor Solitario, my name is Josefa Sauceda. What can I do for you? I told her, Senora, tell me about why this village is called as Tortugas. <laughs> she said, sit down, Senor Ermitaño, and I will tell you. As we were there in the cool of the afternoon breeze, she told me a fascinating story. Once upon a time, she said, this whole village and the area surrounding it was green and lush with vegetation. There were multiple turtles all over the place. But as men grew greedy, the turtles began to disappear. God decided that man should never forget his brutality and his cruelty to these turtles. And so he created a mountain. Do you see just four miles to the east of us? That is called Turtle Mountain. Now every year on the Feast of the Lady of Guadalupe, right on the eve of the Feast of the Lady of Guadalupe, the Indios began to fast and to pray. They walk up to the mountains making reparation for the sins of mankind. They cut down the yaca fibers and they create these walking sticks, these prayer sticks called quiotes. And when they come down, they light bonfires all the way down. Now this has been done since time immemorial. This is to help us remember uh, the cruelty of man to the turtles and so that we never forget to do this. The following day, the women will organize the men into what is called matachines. The matachines are these masked spirit dancers. And what they will do is they will create a lightning serpent on the floor woven by their very handkerchiefs. And then the malinche, the spirit of purity, will come out and stomp on the plumed serpent of Mexico. And thus the new gods and the old are appeased. I continued to walk eastward. The shadows had begun to lengthen upon the land. It was late evening. Following the directions of Senora Salcedo, I was able to find the low slung cave high atop the Oregon Mountains. I arrived there, tried to make myself comfortable, and then I realized that I had made a serious miscalculation. I had forgotten to leave behind the pouch of gold that had been put into my care. I thought that I needed to return it to its rightful owner, but that would have to wait until the morning. I decided that my first night at that cave, I should make reparation for my sins again. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Forgive me, forgive me, I am a miserable sinner. The following morning, I walked out of my cave, down the Oregon Mountains and into the village of Las Cruces. I was looking for my friend Don Ramon Gonzalez. I miscalculated and went to the home of Mrs. Amador, who sent me to the home of Mrs. Armendares. And it was Mrs. Armendares who showed me where Senor Gonzalez was to be found. He asked me about my first night in the cave there. I told him that it had been a little uneasy but rather comfortable. He looked at me and he said, Señor Herbitano, por el amor de Dios, for the love of God, would you do me a favor? Every night before you go to bed, I want you to enkindle a fire there. I can see the fire all the way from here in Las Cruces. It is by that kindling of fire that I will know that you are alive and that you are well. He said, this is a very dangerous place for you up there. 
If the Apache Indians do not kill you, then the snakes and the scorpions will. Please promise me, promise me that you will light that fire. I swore to him that I would do. And I returned back to my cave. I, and I had forgotten to give him the pouch of gold. The following day, I felt so miserable because I had forgotten to deliver the gold to its rightful owner. I sat there praying, asking forgiveness for my sins. Somehow I knew that this would be my last day here on earth. I took my flagellum and again I said, Mea culpa, my God, for my sins, both the great and the small. From the time that I have been born to the time that you see me here repentant, have mercy upon me. Have mercy upon me. Forgive me my faults. Forgive me for having failed in my duty. Forgive me for everything that I have ever done to offend all the people until I have gotten here. As I was swinging the flagellum, suddenly I felt a stabbing, a dagger pierced me between the shoulder blades and I fell. In a pool of my own blood, mea culpa, me odeo, forgive me, forgive me. Ay. Ay. As I continue to feel the life force pour out of me, my blood mixed with the water of the cave floor, I felt my hand grasping, grasping for dirt and for ashes. Nothing. That night, Senor Gonzalez failed to see the light enkindled upon the cave again. He mounted his horse and he rode pell-mell haphazardly through the desert. He was sure something terrible had happened to me and that there was evil in the wind. <sighs> As the life force continued to drain out of me, I felt the hand of a weary-looking Ramon Gonzalez who had come to check on my well-being. Ramon was weeping loudly at my tragedy. After he had regrouped his courage, he hoisted my body upon his own bay horse. He himself led the animal gently back down the slopes, back toward Las Cruces. Back at his home, he was met by Mrs. Armendares, who took it upon herself to wash my own body. She then folded my hair shirt and my habit and deposited it gently upon a trunk that she had. In it too she put my rosary, my scourge, and my breviary. The news of my death and murder spread like wildfire across the entire Messia Valley. More shocking than the foul deed itself was the rampant speculation that followed the announcement of my death. Who would have been the one to have had the motive. What secrets must I have taken with me into my grave? It was to be and to remain one of the greatest mysteries in the history of New Mexico. My body was deposited in a plain wooden box. A funeral was held for me on April the 17th, 1869 at San Albino's Church in La Mesilla. Father Cabeza de Vaca himself officiated. Later on, six young men took me upon their shoulders and laid me at the cemetery of La Mesilla. In the meantime, people were coming by, kissing their lips and trying to touch the coffin. When they lowered me in the grave, they covered me and put a simple marker that said, 
Giovanni Maria Agostini Giustiniani, hermit of the old and the new worlds. May he rest in peace. In pace, requiescat. A few days after my own funeral, Senor Romero was tending to his own farm up in Las Vegas, New Mexico. Suddenly he was seized by a feeling of desolation. He mounted his horse and he rode back up to my cave. He was not terribly shocked when he found out that the large grave hole that we had both dug had been completely filled in. That evening, he invited all of the members of the Confraternidad del Solitario, Los Hermanos Penitentes, to hold their prayer services there at my cave and at my grave. He himself snapped a primitive photograph of the entire scene. The next day, when he went to develop his film, though, as he raised the film out of its liquid emulsion, he was shocked because there, not only was there a picture of my cave and my grave, but the Hermanos Penitentes del Solitario and above them, the Madonna herself surrounded by angels. They had come to, to bless my place of rest. Now the question is this, was I back in Las Cruces at the Oregon Mountains or was I in Las Vegas? A real hermit who knows how to bilocate <laughs> would have no trouble being in both places at the same time. <laughs>